We are glad that you're here with us because I know you're here to help us to accomplish the show's two objectives. First, to glorify our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and secondly, to encourage each other in the Lord. And the fact that you're here, I know that you're here to help us accomplish these objectives. So again, I want to welcome us all near and far. If you are in, in the continent of Africa, Asia, Europe, North America, South America, we just want to welcome us all as it is our custom. We do have a great show for you. Our general topic is who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And based upon the abundant evidence of scripture so far, from Genesis to Revelation, we have discovered that Jesus is the creator of the world, the sustainer of the world, the redeemer of the world, and that is coming back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Our hundred guest is my friend and my colleague in ministry, Pastor Lawrenson. And we're looking forward to hear what God will say through his manservant to us to encourage us in these difficult days. I think we could all agree that these are troublesome times. But let's take courage. Let's be hopeful. Because the God who we serve, nothing catch him by surprise. He is aware of all the things that are going on in this world, all the things that are going on in our lives. And in fact, he has made provision for you and he has made provision for me. So as such, all we have to do is continue to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ and he will direct us going forward. And as such, I ask you to bow your head with me as I ask him even to continue to lead us going forward. A good God of heaven and earth, we are here to serve you because you're God. All by yourself, you're God. And as we stop by here to explore more about you, Jesus, we want to know more about you. And we know the best way to know about you is to spend time in your word. So such we come to read your written word. So Father, as we try to discover what's in the pages of your books, we pray, Father, that thou, God, the Holy Spirit, will guide our thoughts, guide our mind, that whatever we picked up from the scripture, it may be guided by God, the Holy Spirit. And Father, we also know so far, based on what we have read so far, that you're concerned about those who are sick, so I pray a special blessings over all those that are sick, that God, the Holy Spirit, will come near to them. Now I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor, it is really a privilege to have you, and I could really use a word from an, an eye at this point. So thank you for being here. Once again to you, uh, Pastor Barnaby, I truly um, appreciate the honor of sharing the word of God with our listening audience. I look forward to this every Monday evening. And I pray that each time the God, the message that he has in store, that we will be sanctified through it, through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. Let us offer with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your matchless love, your tender mercies the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. Thank you for this platform. Thank you for endowing Pastor Sister Barnaby with the wisdom, the knowledge, the talent, the giftedness, whereby they could bring to fruition the vision that you give them. I pray that you will bless them abundantly. And all who are listening today, may each of us, find a renewed commitment with you and that our faith will be rekindled and our commitment deepened in the word of God and in Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. Amen, praise the Lord. Um, this evening, I want to share with you the uh, message titled, The Christian Church and the Battle Over the Holy Scriptures. The, the Christian church and the battle over the Holy Scriptures. Um, 
For the past couple of weeks, I have been presenting studies referring to Christ's approach and reference to the book of Daniel, and also how he related and connected the two with the signs of his eminent return, the last days. You know, the study of the last day events, the last days, is a keen and unique to, um, to the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. It is a theological term that they often use, and you may have heard it before, it's called eschatology, the doctrine pertaining to the last days. There are two passages of scripture that I want to establish as a platform. Well, one in particular, Matthew chapter 24, verses 23 to 28. And the other one is Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1. And both references um, uh, referred to the uh, condition that Christianity faces in light of biblical truth. So let us begin by looking at modern Christianity versus Bible Christianity. Now there's a distinction, there's a difference. There's a clear difference between those who profess to know the Lord, those who profess to believe in God. They carry his name, according to Isaiah chapter 4. They carry his name, but they want to do their own thing. And they ask the question, Lord, can we be called by your name, but allow us to eat our own food, dress our own the way we want, and do whatever that is pleasing to us, but only the name. It seems that the name Christianity is used more like a name brand as opposed to the commitment to biblical integrity commitment to study the word of God. Jesus predicted in Matthew chapter 24 that in the last days there will be a pollution of the holy place. Chapter 24 verse 15. And it came to pass for the previous sessions we dealt with that. Now we are looking at another prediction that Christ made. He says that there will be false Christ in the last days. In other words, false teachers, false preachers, and false leaders in the Christian church. What makes them false? The answer. It is the method by which they, Christians, are interpreting the Holy Scriptures. A false message denotes a false messenger. Likewise, a false teacher and a false prophet denotes a false uh, rendition of the word of God. If a person's lifestyle, set of values or beliefs contradicts the word of God and the teachings of the Bible, then there are two things that can be done. One, Personal repentance by allowing the Holy Spirit to do an inward change of the heart. And number two, humility of spirit by having a willingness to denounce and dismiss all false theories, fabricated concepts, and ideas that are contrary to the Holy Scriptures and the will of God. These are the, th the two things that can be done when a person or an individual comes at cross airs with biblical truth. Today, my friends, the church is facing an unprecedented challenge of presenting the pure, unadulterated truth of the word of God. Point number one, human nature is sinful and therefore in and of itself cannot respond to holiness except through the gift of of repentance. The Bible says men would rather darkness than light. John chapter 3 verse 19. Job chapter 24 verse 13 says rebellion is to turn against the light. And Jesus says thy word, um, David says thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So then when we look at what Jesus says in John chapter 3, verse 19, men 
would rather darkness than light and what uh david says in psalm 119 verse um 165 thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path clearly indicates clearly indicates that in the last days professed christians or professed believers would rather take the path of walking in non-biblical precepts rather than holding on to the word of god which gives light to uh to the path of humanity so jesus clearly predicts that in the last days men would rather darkness than light in other words if the word of god is light and men would rather darkness than light they would rather hold on to non-scriptural and non-biblical tradition rather than holding on to the word of god it is interesting to note that the prophet samuel in first samuel's chapter 15 verse 23 made mention of human taking, turning their backs on God as a form of rebellion. And he equates rebellion to turn away from God and turn away from light as witchcraft. You will find this in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. In Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 23, Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, and also you'll find the same reference in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 1, Forgive me if I am going a little too fast. Uh, I will try my best to slow down so that you would have the time to note down those passages of scripture, which is very vital and pertinent to the presentation this evening. Jeremiah 5, 23, and Isaiah 30, verse 1, corroborates that with, with 1 Samuel 15, 23, that rebellion and disobedient people see God as unfair and unjust, and therefore they would rather to walk in their own ways rather than in the principles and precepts of God. Now, it brings us to point number two. Instead of following God, men would rather set their own standards to suit themselves and putting down and putting their personal opinions or reasoning above the word of God. Let me repeat this. According to what we are witnessing today, in light of what the Bible predicts, point number two states, according to the presentation that I'm sharing with you today, instead of following God, man would rather set their own standards to suit themselves and putting their opinions or reasoning above the word of God. That's where we are today. Hence the reason why Jesus says, men would rather darkness than light. Now we have biblical examples of rebellious people uh, throughout the scriptures. Beginning with the, the first individual, the first being, who rebelled against God, Lucifer. Then after Lucifer rebelled against God, he would rather follow his own path than to follow the, in obedience to the will of God. We find Adam and Eve. Then after Adam and Eve, then Cain. Then the people before the flood. Then a mighty warrior by the name of Nimrod. Then Nebuchadnezzar. Then King Saul, the Pharaoh of Egypt, pharaohs of Egypt. And then in the New Testament, during the time of Christ, we have the scribes and the Pharisees and other groups, subgroups that openly uh, rejected the teachings and instructions that Jesus Christ taught and gave to the world. The question we need to ask at this juncture is, what do all of these characters, individuals, what do they have in common? From Lucifer all the way down to the people of Christ's day and those of our day and time. What they have in common is self-centeredness and pride. The Bible says pride comes before a fall. Human beings who have chosen rather to rely upon their own 
personal opinions rather than on divine counsel and what God says is putting pride before, is relying on pride and therefore allowing their pride to control their decision-making process. Therefore, they fall into a state of rebellion and disobedience. Now, let us look at some key biblical passages that will solidify and establish this principle of, or rather, the decision of making a choice between right and wrong, true and false, biblical principles versus non-biblical principles. In John chapter 5, verse 39, principle number one, and these are some guidelines that I am sharing with our listening audience, with you, our listening audience. Principle number one, we must not doubt the scriptures. We must not doubt the Holy Scriptures. Why? Because in John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus says, these are they which testify of me. Principle number two, we must look at the internal evidence found in the scriptures. Principle number two, we must look at the internal evidence of truth, reliability, sustainability, and all of this found in the Holy Scriptures. In Luke 10, 26, Jesus asked the question, how readest thou? In other words, if the Bible or the Scriptures is not read correctly, and the right hermeneutics or exegesis is not applied to the word of God, then human beings are liable to arrive at wrong conclusions and therefore forfeit themselves of the benefit of having the right understanding. Principle number, number three, principle number three. We must look at the harmony of scriptures the harmony of scriptures. Look at the way the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, how and all the books between, how they agree with each other. There is not one book in the Bible that contradicts the other. There is perfect harmony and blend and complementary uh, roles between all the prophets who wrote the Bible, over 40 different prophets, and of the different messages that are written in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Very remarkable, remarkable. Now, Jesus says in Luke chapter 24, verse 44, Jesus says that in seeking the harmony of scriptures, we must look at the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. The law, the prophets, and the Psalms. In other words, what Christ did essentially was that he summarize the entire Old Testament scriptures to show to humanity that there is no disagreement, no discrepancy, and that for us to follow and for those in his day and time to follow the written word is to establish the guidelines of the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. Now, you know, the law points to the Torah, the written works of Moses from Genesis to Deuteronomy, the prophets include all the prophets of the Old Testament, the old, the major prophets, the minor prophets, the the uh, the Psalms referred to the the um, wisdom literature of Solomon and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and the Psalms of David and the other Psalm writers. Principle number four. Principle number four. We must allow the scriptures to build our faith. Principle number four, we must allow the Holy Scriptures to build our faith. Now, why is this so important? Because the Apostle Paul says in Romans 10 verse 17, in Romans chapter 10 verse 17, the Apostle Paul says, faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. Romans 10 verse 17. So when we listen to the word of God, we are allowing, we are engaging in an exercise of allowing the word to build our faith. In other words, our trust in the written 
uh, instructions conveyed in the word of God, in the scriptures, in the Bible. Uh, principle number five, principle number five, we have to be willing to obey the scriptures. We have to be willing to obey what the scripture says. The passage of scripture that affirms this is Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Acts chapter 5, verse 29. We are told, again, by the great apostle Paul, we, when uh, the disciples, rather, said to the authorities who, um, who prohibited them from reading and studying the Bible, they answered and said, we will serve God rather than man. We will serve God rather than man. So principle number five, we must be willing to obey what the scripture says and not the traditions or the statements issued by human authority. In other words, we will not put human authority above that of God. Very important. All right. So let me go through those principles again quickly. Principle number one, we must not doubt the scriptures. Principle number two, we must look for internal evidence in the scriptures to, so that we will arrive at the right conclusion. Principle number three, we must look for the harmony of scriptures. Principle number four, we must allow the scriptures to build our faith. And principle number five, we must be willing to obey what the scripture says rather than what man says. Very important. Now, what proof or method do we have when we are engaged in uh, biblical study? Biblical study. What, what proof do we have? What methodology do we employ in a systematic way of studying the Bible? There is a terminology that we use as Protestant churches, not all Protestant, but rather predominantly Seventh-day Adventist Protestant uh, theologians. We use the, uh, the biblical uh, approach to scriptures um, known as the historical grammatical method of biblical interpretation. So let me break this down. Number one, we look for internal evidence. Number two, we allow the scriptures to stand on its own. Number three, we use the scriptures as its own best interpreter. Number four, we follow Christ and the disciples' approach or methodology. Number five, we speak when the Bible speak and remain silent when the scriptures or the prophets or the apostles are silent. We do not add nor subtract from the word of God. John gave us this specific warning in Revelation 22. So therefore, um, this approach, look for the internal evidence, allow the scriptures to stand on its own, use the scriptures for as its best own interpreter, follow Christ and his disciples, approach and methodology, then speak the word when the word speaks and remain silent when it is silent. This, in, in a nutshell, a, or this approach, rather, in a nutshell, is what is known as the historical grammatical method of biblical interpretation. So I just summarize this um, theological term to you. Now, there is a contradiction with other churches who chose not to follow this blueprint or this rubric or this method for biblical interpretation. What method does the Catholic Church follow that contradicts the Protestant approach to biblical interpretation? The Catholic scholars came up with the plan to stop the Reformation. They came up with a plan to stop the Protestant Reformation. That uh, plan is called the Counter Reformation. The Counter Reformation. Now, this new method of interpreting the scriptures, which is um, which which is what has been established by most prominent scholars, the historical grammatical method, was 
in, was contradicted or went to or became a problem with some other Protestant uh, denominations who rather take a different route or different approach. They followed after the Catholic position of the Counter-Reformation. The Counter-Reformation was a plan to stop the Reformation. And the reason why they came up with that because they wanted to strike a balance or to compromise between scripture and tradition. Between what the word of God says and what human wisdom or human opinion says. So wanted to strike a balance between human position and divine position on the proper or correct method to interpret the Bible. This new method to interpret the scriptures was fertilized in the minds of some scholars. Among them was Westcott and Hort. Westcott and Hort were two outstanding Protestant scholars, and they came up with the term, the historical critical method of biblical interpretation, the historical critical method of biblical interpretation. This new approach or methodology is also called higher criticism. They accept human reason and science as valid means to interpret the scriptures. Here is how they did it. Number one, human intelligence and reason can be used to critique portions of the Bible to prove it true or false. That's what they came up with. They said that human intelligence and reason can be used to critique portions of the Bible to prove it whether it's true or false. Two, they say science or scientific data or data is more reliable than what the prophets wrote. They say scientific data or data is more reliable than what the prophets wrote. Number three, they believe that there is a need to change any approach that will coincide or that will agree with modern times and modern science. So therefore, using modern means to interpret the Bible is necessary. Number four, no longer are believers under the patriarchal system, they claim, therefore, uh, the, the new system would require for leadership to be viewed on an equal basis. In other words, no more male dominance, no more under the patriarchal male dominance system, gender equality in leadership, ministry, and even sexuality is therefore part of the modern way or the modern, modern method of which to accept uh, the interpretation of scriptures. Now, this approach uh, is common through the modern churches that have accepted the historical critical method of biblical interpretation. They have accepted higher criticism as a method for biblical interpretation rather than the historical grammatical method of biblical interpretation. The, the historical critical method is at odds with the historical grammatical method. The historical critical method is known as higher criticism. Whereas the historical grammatical method is known as the proof text method. We as Seventh-day Adventist Protestants, we follow the proof text, the proof text, which is the historical grammatical, not higher criticism, which embrace human wisdom, science, and modern technology as means to interpret the Bible, which they claim to be of equal value based on the modern times. Now, I would like to read a few statements from a very well-known book among Seventh-day Adventism. This book is called or known as The Great Controversy, The Great Controversy. And the author of this book in, on page 582 to 586 says, and I quote, whenever the divine precepts are rejected, 
sin ceases to appear sinful or righteousness desirable. Those who refuse to submit to the governance of God are wholly unfitted to govern themselves. Great Controversy, page 582, 586. Heck is another statement, and I quote, through their pernicious teachings, the spirit of insubordination is implanted in the hearts of children and youth and are naturally impatient, uh, who are naturally impatient or or out of control, and a lawless, licentious state of society results. While scoffing at the credulity of those who obey the requirements of God, the multitudes eagerly accept the delusions of Satan. These are very strong statements, and it's worth pondering because it adds to the subject matter which is man accepting uh, human reasoning and human science above the word of God. Now, we are not saying, I'm not saying that science doesn't have its place. I'm not saying that science ought to be rejected. I'm not saying that science is not valid. What I'm saying here is we cannot put science over and above the scriptures. Why? Because God is more knowledgeable than man. God is more knowledgeable than man. And so while we accept science, but we must not give science... We must not give human knowledge or give human scientific approach a superior, a superior position over the inspiration of the word of God. All right? So this is very important. Another statement from the book Great Controversy, which I find to be very fascinating, page 587 says, and now as in former ages, Satan has worked through the churches to further his designs. The religious organizations of the day have refused to listen to popular truths plainly brought to view in the scriptures. And in combating them, they have adopted interpretations and taken positions which have sown broadcast the seeds of skepticism. And then I conclude with one of my favorite quotes, page 595. God will have a people upon the earth before Christ's second coming, that is, that will maintain the Bible and the Bible only or the Bible alone as the standard of all doctrine and the basis of all reforms. The creed of learned men of ecclesiastical counsel, as numerous as are the churches which they represent should not be accepted as evidence for or against any point of religious faith before accepting any precept we must demand a plain thus saith the lord i find these statements to be truly enlightening fascinating at best and instructive to us living in our modern time. But I need to also point you to where it all started. We know how Lucifer rebelled against God in heaven. We know how in the Old Testament, all the men who disobeyed God, they went contrary to the instructions give, that was given to them by the prophets. Because the prophets served as the mouthpiece of God. And then we saw how Jesus, when he came to this earth, the devil tried to deceive and to have him to, to fall into uh, his temptations by misquoting the Bible, Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus had to rebuke him and clearly st state that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, you remember not the way Satan approached Jesus with his temptations was similar to the way he approached Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Because he misquoted the Bible, misquoted the word of God to Eve when, when God said to Eve and Adam, do not eat the fruit. Satan lied. He added to what God said. So he misapplied. He, 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 he presented a heresy to them 
says, didn't God say the day you touch, you know, misapply. Misapplying the word of God is what seems to be common among popular Protestant preachers and teachers of the word. Hence the reason why Jesus says, in the last days there will be false Christ and false prophets, false teachers, false preachers. And what makes them false is because they misapply and misinterpret the word of God. Now, I need to take you to a major event that took place during the history of Christianity, known as the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent. You may have heard of this council, but have you taken the time to look into the details of the Council of Trent, of Trent to find out what was the main point of debate, main point of concern, what led to such a conclave, what led to such a, uh, a, a coming together of the key theologians and thought leaders of the day and time residing in the Catholic religion because Catholicism was the center of Christianity during the Middle Ages. The Council of Trent held between 1545 and 1563 AD, the Council of Trent led, was held between 1545 and 1563 AD. The Catholic religion literally fulfilled what Christ said. Christ said in the last days there will be false teachers and false Christ and false prophets. They literally fulfilled that, and we're going to see how. The Council of Trent was prompted by the Protestant Reformation described as the counter-reformation. It was the Protestant Reformation that brought them together, that led them to respond to the teachings of the Protestant churches because the Protestant churches, the Protestant Reformation began to expose or did expose the corruption, the doctrinal corruption that was prevalent within the teachings or the catechism of the Catholic Church. So when the Council of Trent came together, there was the debate between tradition and scripture. As the leader of Christianity, every doctrine of the Catholic Church had and was based solely on tradition rather than on scripture. So there was a big problem. The problem was, what are you going to hold on to? Are you going to hold on scripture or are you going to hold on to or are you going to hold on to tradition? So in that council, the, the Council of Trent decide to hold on to both scripture and tradition. And in some cases, they exalt tradition above the Holy Scriptures. So when the Council of Trent accept both tradition and scripture, as a rule of faith and conduct and truth, in most cases, they exalt tradition, human tradition, above the Holy Scriptures. Complete departure from the Word of God. What was the Protestant response to the Council of Trent resolution? The Protestants' disagreement with the Council of Trent came through three main points. There are several, but I'm going to share with you three main points. The Protestant decided to endorse justification by faith alone, sola fede. Sola fede. The Protestant Reformation decided to endorse justification by faith, sola fede, apart from anything including good works a position that the Catholic Church condemned as heresy. The Catholic Church condemned justification by faith as heresy. In fact, the Council of Trent even issued an edict uh, stating that they pronounce a curse upon any church that will accept justification by faith, and they claim it to be anathema, anathema, you know, blasphemy against the Catholic hierarchy because the church reject human tradition and embraced scripture and place scripture above human tradition. That was the Protestant Reformation position 
in response to the Council of Trent. Number two, the Protestant Reformation rejected the Apocrypha. The Protestant Reformation rejected the Apocrypha as part of the biblical canon. You need to understand that the term Apocrypha comes from the Greek word, means hidden, hidden. It is a collection of ancient Jewish writings and is the title given to these books, which was written between 300 to 30 BC before Christ, in the era between the Old and the New Testament known as the intertestamental period. So that was the time the apocryphal, the Jewish apocryphal writings the, known as hidden books were written. The Bible is never considered hidden. God wrote the scriptures, allowed the prophets to write the scriptures so that it would be made known to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. That has been God's plan from the beginning and will continue through the end. So the Protestant churches rejected the apocryphal books. It is important to note that many doctrines unique to Catholicism, such as the teachings of purgatory, prayers for the dead, and salvation by works are found in the apocryphal books. Hence the reason why the Protestants had to reject them. So today now, as we looked at the tension between scripture and tradition, the appeal that God is sending to us through this platform is for us to choose scripture above human tradition. We have to make the decision that we rather serve God like the early apostles did rather than man. Jesus gives the criteria upon which we must follow the scriptures. For these are they which testify of me. Any written instructions, whether it be catechism or some church dogma that, that exalt man above the Bible must and ought to be rejected, my friends. Human beings must never be worshipped. Human beings must never be idolized. Only Jesus, only Christ. He's the one who died on the cross of Calvary for our sins. And so therefore, when we proclaim Jesus Christ, when he says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Jesus says, search the scriptures, for in them you'll have life eternal, for these are they which testify of me. David says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus again says, in the last days, men would rather darkness than light. And as a result of human tradition, Protestantism today is no longer protesting against the corruption of doctrine or the corruption of scripture. Protestantism, modern Protestantism, have acquiesced and coalesce with uh, the doctrinal teachings of, the, of Catholicism, and they have embraced tradition over scripture. And there are many doctrines that are being taught in Protestant churches today that are not soundly based on scripture. Let me repeat, there are many doctrines within Protestantism today that are not soundly based on scripture. They are more, they are more tradition rather than scriptural. And so we are at a cross heirs with what a man teaches and what God teaches in his word. My dear friends, praying for the dead, that's not based on scripture. Most of the times you attend Protestant funeral services and they talk about how their relatives who have died, their loved ones who have died are listening. They are up in heaven. They're watching over them and all of that. You have heard this. I don't have to go through the details. That is not based on scripture. The Bible says for the dead know not anything. And so therefore, when... Even when uh, Lazarus had died, Lazarus did not know that he was, he could not relate to any questions uh, while he was in the death, the, while he, he, he died, while he was dead. Why? Because the dead know not anything. And so therefore, my friends, the teachings of purgatory Purgatory is not based on the Bible. It is from the, the apocryphal books. The apocryphal books were never endorsed by Jesus, nor, of the, nor by the disciples. Jesus says the scriptures are the 
law, the prophets, and the Psalms, which takes in consideration all the Old Testament, which ended with Malachi. So therefore, the disciples, not Jesus Christ, endorsed the apocryphal books. Not only that, but we find Sunday observance. Sunday observance is not biblical. Sunday observance came from paganism. I mean, the Catholic Church acknowledge and admit that. And most honest Protestants will tell you the same. But the seventh day Sabbath, which is Saturday, from Genesis has been consistent. You go and ask modern Judaism today, and they will tell you there's no debate. There's no debate. There is consistency of scripture, consistency historically that proves that the Sabbath has never been changed. It has remained consistently on Saturday and not Sunday, the first day of the week. So now we find um, many of the other teachings that have infiltrated Protestantism today um, contradicts the Bible. And I'm going to conclude with two, three passages of scripture. Number one, Jesus says in John 5, 39, search the scriptures for in them you think you have life eternal and these are they which testify of me. Luke says, thou opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Luke 24, 45. Acts chapter 17, verse 11 says, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily. Acts 17, verse 11. The apostle Peter says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. First Peter chapter 1, verse 23. And lastly, John the Revelator says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, that is the one written in Revelation, and keep those things that are written therein, for the time is at hand. My friends, may God bless you today. May God open your mind to the deeper understanding of his word. And may God continue to enlighten you and to give you the desire to know the truth. For, the, for those who know the truth, the truth shall set them free. So I conclude on this note so that Pastor Barnaby will entertain your questions and we will walk you through what has been presented to you this evening. Praise God, praise God. Thank you, Pastor. I want to uh, start to unpack uh, the great information that you shared with us by focusing on two words, tradition and scripture. Right. Tradition and scripture. Will this two words summarize where we are, what you presented to us in a nutshell? Going back to what Jesus says, in the last days, there will be false Christ and false prophets. And what defines truth from error is the correct methodology of interpreting the word of God. If you do not use the correct method of biblical interpretation, you will arrive at a false conclusion. And when you arrive at a false conclusion or false, false teaching will emerge. And therefore, the person who preaches or teaches false in false doctrine is essentially a false prophet or false teacher. And that's what Christ says is going to be rampant in the last days. And what has happened now to us and what we are seeing as a reality today is the exaltation of human knowledge, human wisdom, and human science above the scriptures. And so the choice now people make is what seems to be more, more, more appealing to them. Uh, what seems to be more appealing is human tradition, human knowledge, rather than the say of the Lord. In fact, the reason why, Pastor Bonaby, most people choose, they rather choose human tradition above the word of God, because human tradition... Um, pacifies human error. It embraces human error. You, human tradition embraces falsehood and sinful lifestyle. 
you know, human tradition will not rock the boat. Human tradition will pat you on the shoulder. Human tradition will give you a nice warm hug, so to speak, and tell you what, where you are is okay. What you are practicing is okay. The day you worship is fine. There's no problem. That's what human tradition will teach you. But the word of God will tell you, no, thus save the Lord, for I change not save the Lord. And so when the Lord says he changes not, his principle never change, his law never change, his requirements never change. He is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Hello, my name is Pastor Owen Bonaby, President of Final Shout Television and Social Media Network. Final Shout's objective is to join hands and hearts with our fellow men, holy angels, and God himself in sharing God's redemptive love with the entire world, that Jesus is the creator of the world, the sustainer of the world the Redeemer of the world, and that Jesus has promised us he will come back to receive us unto himself. Please join our mission in reaching 2 billion people with God's redemptive love in three ways, with your time, your giftedness, and your resource. First, with your time. Watch and share Final Shout 24-7 anywhere in the world on the following platforms. Final Shout on Rooker TV. Final Shout on Fire TV. Final Shout TV on Apple TV. Social media such as Facebook or Meta. YouTube, Twitter. Download or Android and Apple phone apps. Or you can watch us 24-7 on our website. Watch.fanashout.org Second, with your giftedness. Become Fana Shout's show producer, director, contributor, host, hostess, or you can tell us of your giftedness and how you would like to serve. Third, with your resource. Support Final Shout financially. Become Final Shout's 12 Stars Club member, which help with our monthly operations budget. Two, become a sponsor of a show or sponsor a series of shows. Both individuals and businesses can be sponsors. And three, choose our merchandise. Thank you in advance for your prayerful consideration in joining our mission in reaching two billion people with God's redemptive love. As the joy of the Lord is Final Shout's strength. Wallace Muffler. Our motto, you bring it, we fix it. Wallace Muffler's services. Here at Wallace Muffler, we offer a wide range of services and repairs. With over 37 years of experience that you can trust and count on for all your vehicle's health needs. We practice proactive car health maintenance and prompt repair service. Specializing in mufflers, brakes and any mechanical issue. You bring it, we fix it services we offer are 
air and cabin filter, air conditioning, battery, body and trim, brake service and repair, brakes, check engine light and diagnostic, electrical, exhaust, oil change, steering and suspension, transmission, and tires. Here at Wallace Muffler, we promise 100% customer satisfaction guaranteed. Same day service for most repairs. Work is done right the first time. Call us here at Wallace Muffler for an appointment at 203 850 3253 or visit us at 379 Welton Street, Hamden, Connecticut 06517. See you there. Taj Realty make your dreams a reality. Taj Real Estate LLC is a full service firm specializing in commercial and residential properties, short sale, sale and marketing of existing homes, condos and rentals, FHA 203K sales, and first time home buyers, investor purchase and mortgage. We offer mortgages for investors and commercial clients. Non-owner occupant, no income, self-employed, low income. Let us guide you to the neighborhood that's a fit for you. If you're looking for a starter, a first time home, a cottage, a vacation home, colonial, a city comfort, suburban, a hidden tranquility, luxury, a lifestyle, chateau, a modern French style, even a waterfront beauty. Or, if you're interested in commercial investments, a strip mall shopping center, hotel, city high rise, storefront, commercial shop space, office space, business place. Whether it's commercial or residential, whether you're looking for a mortgage, buying, selling, or renting. Taj is just a call away. Do you have a question? Come in person and experience our full service at 630 Dixwell Avenue, New Haven, Connecticut, 06511. Or visit us on the web, Taj Real Estate, LLC, Dot com. A call away. Call today. Call 203 691 1385.